Good afternoon, folks, or good morning, depending on where you are. Um, I'm seeing the numbers here kind of tick up a little bit. So um, we'll get started right now, and, and hopefully folks will kind of trickle in as, as time goes on. So welcome, everyone, to Pilar Maza's webinar, basically a all-encompassing OFCCP primer and really understanding sort of the impact of OFCCP's policy changes um, for the coming years, right? So we had a new administration, we have a new director, so we're going to really sort of take a dive into what the OFCCP will likely look like in the coming years and what, um, you know, you as a federal contractor should expect um, moving forward. My name is Sarah Nasseri. I'm an attorney in the Labor and Employment Practice Group at Pilar Maza. Um, I advise employers on a range of workplace rela related matters, focusing on legal and regulatory compliance. So a lot of what I do is OCCP, um, fortunately or unfortunately for me. Um, so, you know, we work with a huge government contracting um, clientele who, uh, you know, deal with the OCCB on a daily basis. Regarding the firm itself, um, on the next slide, Pilar Maza, as many of you may know, is a business law firm. We offer a range of um, expertise in a variety of different practice areas, ranging from, you know, bid protests and, and government contracting work, all the way to labor and employment and specifically labor and employment for government contractors. So this of course includes the OFCCP work, the audits and so forth. So um, there's a list of everything that we do. And let's uh, dive right in. So to kind of get started on um, as far as a background, as many of you may or may not know, um, the OFCCP is short for the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Program. It is a subdivision of the US Department of Labor. So it's an agency essentially under the umbrella of the Department of Labor. Um, the agency is basically responsible for ensuring that any entity, any employer doing business with the federal government is compliant with uh, those non-discriminatory rules and regulations, right? So taking affirmative action measures, ensuring that you are not discriminating your workforce on the basis of any of the protected classes and so forth. So a little bit more as far as the agency itself and the specific laws. Um, this, you know, is on the OFCCP website, their mission statement, but I think it's worth sort of reiterating here, and I'll just go through it really quickly. But basically, the OFCCP, their mission is to protect workers, promote diversity, and enforce the law. Um, they hold those who do business with the federal government, so this inclu includes not only your prime contractors, but also your subcontractors. Uh, responsible for complying with the legal requirement to take affirmative action and not discriminate on the basis of the following protected classes, right? So race, color, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, religion, national origin, disability, or status as a protected veteran. So a whole range, um, you'll note that until Title VII just got, um, you know, a little bit broader with the inclusion of sexual orientation, gender identity, following the the recent Supreme Court case, the OFCCP always had within its laws um, protection of those specific protected categories, right? So um, it was always, you know, pretty broad uh, for federal contractors as far as the protected categories that they needed to ensure. Um, you know, no discrimination was taking place against and so forth. So um, they do a lot. There's there's a lot that's involved and there's certainly um, an agency that all federal contractors should be aware of. So what are the three different laws that the OFCCP administers? So um, these are the big ones. The first is Executive Order 11246. This establishes requirements for non-discriminatory practices in hiring and employment on the basis of uh, sex, 
race, color, and so forth. So females and minorities will fall under this umbrella of the executive order. Um, section 503 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, better known as just Section 503, this requires um, affirmative action and prohibits employment discrimination with regard to individuals with disabilities, right? So we'll talk a little bit more about the, the monetary thresholds that sort of fall under each of these laws. But Section 503 deals specifically with individuals with disabilities. And then finally, Vietnam Era Veterans Readjustment Assistance Act of 1974, better known as VEVRA. This is essentially to ensure protection of uh, all veterans. So it used to only be protection of, of returning veterans from the Vietnam War and and ensuring that there was no discriminatory actions taken for those specific class of veterans, but now it essentially covers any and all protected veterans um, under the law. So those are the three big laws. Those are the three laws that the OFCC has jurisdiction to enforce. And those are essentially what um, you know audits are based on, what the rules and regulations are based on, and what the affirmative action obligations are related to. So these are the jurisdictional thresholds. Um, I will say, you know, just sort of off topic here, the OCCP website is pretty, pretty good. <laughs> um, you know, that's one thing that they do pretty well. And that's sort of part of their mission, especially over the past few years. And, and um, you know, I think a lot of it was promoted by ex-director Craig Lean. Um, under the Trump administration, but a lot of what they try to do or strive to do at least is sort of build a relationship with the contractor community. And, and one way of doing this is having a lot of sort of guidance and assistance. And, you know, we'll talk about the technical assistance guides and, and the, all these different manuals and so forth on their website that is very accessible and provides a great deal of information. So I do encourage any federal contractors or subcontractors out there to, to sort of use the resources that are available on the OFCCP's website because they do provide a fair amount. Um, one of those resources being these sort of charts that outline the jurisdictional thresholds under each of the three different laws. So. This, I, I usually, you know, I keep this handy. It's, it's, you know, exactly what you need as far as making sure that you understand what obligations you have. Um, because you may, for example, have a federal contractor. You may be a contractor that falls under the scope of, you know, Executive Order 11246, but you may not meet the monetary threshold under VEVRA, so your obligations there do not, um, do not come into play, right? So, um, just to briefly sort of go over this, because this is pretty self-explanatory, but you'll see that for the Executive Order 11246, it's a pretty low bar, right? So this is um, for your supply and service and your construction contractors, it's any number of employees, and then contracts valued at more than $10,000. So pretty much every contractor, I shouldn't say every, the majority of the contracts with the federal government are likely going to, you know, be far more than that $10,000 threshold. Um, so the obligations of Executive Order 11246 generally should apply for the most part to every federal contractor. Now, what sort of becomes um, distinct with every federal contractor is really the obligations for developing an affirmative action plan or an AAP, right? So you'll know um, for supply and service contractors, that number of employees goes up to 50, right? So you need at least 50 or more employees. And then you also need a contract valued at $50,000 or more. And if you meet both of those thresholds, then you have an obligation to develop an AAP, which is a quite a tedious process. <laughs> um, and it involves a lot more, it involves narratives, putting together analyses and so forth. Um, but that's something to, to keep in mind, right? So not just because you have sort of that minimum threshold um, doesn't necessarily mean that you have an obligation to develop an AP unless you have the 50, what we call the 50-50 rule. So 50 or more employees and then a contract of 50,000 or more. Now that's just executive order 11246. You go down to section 503. 
um, you see the numbers sort of change a little bit, right? So it goes up to $15,000 for the value of the contract. Um, and then for Vevra, you go all the way up to $150,000 for the value of the contract. And then the monetary thresholds do change for the AP coverage as well. Again, this is all self-explanatory. All of this is on the screen here and available on the OFCCP's website. But really the main point here being that there are different monetary and employee count thresholds that you should be aware of um, in order to ensure that you, you are meeting the obligations that you are required to meet, right? So I would ensure that every contractor reviews this and takes note of exactly what laws they actually need to comply with. So again, we talked about this, but the OFCCP does have the authority to enforce these three different laws. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that enforcement looks like. Um, generally, I'm sure many of you are aware that a lot of it, um, uh, you know, a lot of what they do are, are audits, right? So they say whether it's a compliance check or just to make sure that you're keeping uh, records that you need to or actually doing a full on-site desk audit, that's part of the enforcement authority that the OFCCP has to, in order to ensure that federal contractors are complying with their OFCCP obligations, depending on the, which law applies to them. Um, again, just to reiterate, the categories of protected classes are broad. So they do include sexual orientation and gender identity. And then they, of course, include disability and status as a protected veteran. So, um, you know, collectively, these laws make it illegal for contractors and subcontractors to discriminate in employment. This is whether it's in hiring, whether it's in promotion, whether it's in pay, right? It, it sort of encompasses a whole variety of different employment actions um, based on any of those protected categories. So let's talk a little bit about, we talked about sort of the background of the, of the, of the CCP and what they do. Um, now let's talk a little bit more about the future of the OFCCP, right? And I'm looking at my questions. By the way, if there are any questions I should know, feel free to drop them in the uh, question box there. And I'll, you know, as, as much as I can, we'll go through and try to answer these live. I will also obtain a list of all these questions at the end of the webinar, and I will address each of them, you know, individually. Um, so feel free to pop those questions in, whether I address them now or later, I will make sure that I do in fact address them. I, I'm seeing some questions here that pe folks can't hear me. Is that, can we, is that still the case or is anyone still having trouble hearing me? If you are, feel free to drop a note. Okay, I'm not seeing anything there. So I'm hoping that issue got resolved. Um, so let's dive back in. So the future of the OSCCP, I think is, you know, pretty interesting. And I think uh, we want to make sure that, you know, as much as we talk about the history and the background of the OSCCP, I think it's imperative, especially in this climate, to talk about what we can expect and sort of what changes federal contractors can expect with regard to the OSCCP in the coming years. So who's leading the OFCCP now? Uh, there is a new director. Her name is Jenny Yang. So for folks who may have dealt with the OFCCP in the past, um, obviously with a new administration, President Biden appointed a new director. Um, and Director Jenny Yang used to be a plaintiff's attorney. And then she was actually appointed to the chair, to be chair of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, so the EEOC. Um, basically, this I think is it's sort of important to see where she came from because this sort of gives you an understanding of what her, um, you know, sort of demeanor is going to be and also what her experience has been, right? So she's a plaintiff's attorney, so obviously that says a lot about sort of what her background has been and where, you know, where her skills are and, and what she's used to and, and all that stuff and then also she is 
familiar with this type of work, right? So the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission is sort of runs parallel to the OPPT, but it, it you know, deals with enforcement of Title VII, uh, among other things. So it, its applicability is more so towards private employers and the private sector, but sort of the mission of the EEOC and the OPPT are generally the same, right? So ensuring that employers whether they're federal contractors or private employers are not discriminating um, against employees on, on the basis of various protected categories, right? So um, Jenny Ng obviously has experience. One thing that, you know, is sort of been chatter, um, especially in our community is that we, we foresee her making pay equity a priority, right? So while she was chair at the EEOC during, it was during the Obama administration, she spearheaded the collection of paid data from private employers uh, as a method of sort of addressing systemic gender and racial pay gaps, right? Um, now that she's being selected and that she's now leading the OCCP, observers have sort of been waiting to see how she's going to take that pay equity movement that she sort of started at the EEOC and apply it to the OFCCP. So I think we're gonna see a big sort of effort um, to, you know, push the bounds of how the OFCCP is gonna address um, pay equity moving forward. And, you know, I think we're going to see a lot as far as, um, you know, a, a different sort of viewpoint of, of how the OCCP should handle these things. And I think she's going to draw a lot of the experience from um, that she had at the EOC. I will say there was some discussion. She, so she spoke to a live and I think virtual audience just recently on August 2nd at a, at a national conference. Um, and I think it's worth noting sort of some of the priorities that she outlined in that speech. Um, so she talked about, for example, sort of investing and in building the OCCP staff. I think that's one thing that, um, you know, for those of you who have worked with the OCCP in the past, sort of these compliance officers either do not work sort of in a uniform manner or not really experienced that well, or it doesn't seem like they've all been trained the same way. So I think, you know, the hope is if, if she's really prioritizing investing and training and, and sort of building that OFCCP staff that will actually get some more uniformity and, and some more, um, you know, experience from in, in our dealings with the OFCCP. So that was, I think, interesting. Um, there's also a plan, I think, and I don't know if this is changed with the Delta variant, but they were obviously all working uh, remote and virtually. So any audits that were taking place were all happening virtually. I believe at that speech on August 2nd, she mentioned wanting to bring the OFCCP you know, staff back, um, I believe on November 8th. Again, I don't know if that's changed given the, the current state, um, but if that's the case, then we can probably expect you know, in-person OFCCP audits to continue um, and sort of transition back to the way things used to be, right? So um, just some things to, to take note of, but I think the most critical one being that I think the pay equity and general focus on compensation discrimination will be a big thing to watch out for. So this would be a good time um, for federal contractors and subcontractors to think about maybe doing a proactive internal pay audit. Um, that's something our firm has done and, and we continue to do, um, you know, essentially under attorney client privilege, you perform these internal audits um, just to kind of see where uh, your pay or how it's sort of shaping out and then ensure that there are, um, you know, no indicators and no flags. And if there are, then, you know, that's something that you could address before the OCCP comes knocking on your door. So something to take note of there. And their accomplishments in 2020, this was really, you know, I wanted to just make a point that despite the pandemic and despite everything that, you know, happened last year, 
the OCCP did a lot. I mean, I think they were still going full force. Um, you know, it didn't really stop them. In fact, you'll see one of the bullets there. They had their second highest year for monetary settlements at 35.6 million. So, you know, obviously, despite a pandemic, despite, you know, a period of time where, where no one was working, despite, you know, all of that, um, the OFCCP did actually accomplish a lot. So on top of obviously bringing in a lot of settlements and monetary settlements at that, there was a new self ID form issued for dis uh, individuals with disabilities. So hopefully everyone out there has the new form and is using the new form because that is a required form to be distributed. So make sure that you're using that newly issued self ID form for um, individuals with disabilities. There was implementation of the early resolution procedure for conciliation agreements. So I kind of want to actually touch on this a little bit. So conciliation agreements are sort of the settlement agreements of the OFCCP. So if you undergo an audit and the OFCCP finds you know, certain violations, whether it's in pay or in hiring or whatever it is, um, usually, unless it goes to a lawsuit, which you know, doesn't really happen too often, you will enter into a conciliation or settlement agreement with the agency. So what that usually entails is some, you know, description of the violations that have been found, and then some, you know, mechanism for sort of coming into compliance again. So whether it's uh, providing periodic progress reports of, of what you're doing, um, you know, whatever it may be on top of, of course, a monetary settlement and sort of a fine, quote unquote, for, for the discrimination and all that, um, these conciliation agreements are entered into quite often uh, between federal contractors and the agency. And I will note, they are also public. So the OFCCP publishes every single conciliation agreement on its website. It's accessible by anyone and everyone. Um, so, you know, when you're undergoing an audit again, which is why I stress and we'll talk about sort of best practices at the end as far as how to ensure that you, um, you know, are doing everything to make sure that everything looks good and, and you're not having to be in a position where you're entering into conciliation agreement. Um, because, of course, optically, that's not going to present well, you don't want your employees knowing that and all that good stuff. But, um, you know, part of entering into these conciliation agreements, um, the OCCP has sort of provided this, like I would say an incentive program of sorts by introducing ERP or the early resolution procedure. And essentially what they try to do is encourage um, contractors to enter into these early resolution conciliation agreements sort of in exchange for um, exempting the contractor from, I believe it's five years from regularly scheduled compliance evaluations. So the thought here is you're going to work with the agency, you're going to enter into a conciliation agreement. Um, you know, they may waive a monetary settlement, but it ensure that you meet sort of other obligations. But the point being that if you enter into this uh, conciliation agreement, at an earlier stage of your audit with the OFCCP, then we applaud you for that. We appreciate that. We acknowledge you, and we're going to give you a five-year exemption from regularly scheduled compliance evaluations um, for the establishments that are covered under that conciliation agreement. So, um, again, it's sort of part of that effort by the OFCCP to sort of build a, a relationship with the federal contractor community and to sort of make it more of a partnership as opposed to, um, you know, an enforcement agency and, you know, folks that have to sort of deal with um, that enforcement agency. So that's something that they implemented in 2020. Um, you know, we haven't seen too many early resolution conciliation agreements come out of it, but it's also been, you know, implemented for, for about a year. Or so uh, we'll see sort of how that program progresses. The other two things are a focus on Section 503 focused reviews. So one thing that ex-director Lean was sort of adamant about, and this sort of stemmed from personal reasons and, and his personal family, 
um, was sort of this focus on ensuring that individuals with disabilities had the same opportunities as any other people, right? So one thing that he developed and spearheaded was the Section 503 focus reviews. So focus reviews generally are exactly what they sound, right? So it's a on-site review that's focused on one or more components of the contractor's organizations or one or more aspects of the contractor's employment practices, right? So section 503 focus reviews obviously focus only and specifically on section 503 compliance. So if you were subjected to a section 503 focus review, and I dealt with quite a few of these um, with clients over the year, they were essentially just going to come in and ask for, you know, your Section 503 AAP, your reasonable accommodation policies, um, you know, how are you handling your reasonable accommodation requests, are you documenting them, what is, you know, what is the reason behind denying or accepting them, and so forth, right? So, um, if you are subject to the 503 rules and regulations, then I would insist and make sure that you are obviously complying with all of the obligations that fall under section 503 um, because again if you're subject to a focus review a section 503 focus review um, then that's all they're going to check and you want to make sure that everything is in place and in order there um, and then also a high number of non-financial non conciliation agreements so this is one that didn't involve monetary settlements um, but were, you know, things like technical violations for not complying with the record keeping obligations or something like that. So OCCP did a lot and we expect that they will probably uh, be doing a lot over, you know, this year and then over the coming years as well. Other things to look out for in 2021. Um, so this was kind of a big one, and I'm not sure how many folks out there have heard of, of this initiative, but uh, on August 24th, 2018, so it's been about you know over three years at this point that this has sort of been brewing <laughs> by the OFCCP, but the OFCCP did issue a directive um, entitled the Affirmative Action Program Verification Initiative, which aims at ensuring covered contractors are annually preparing and implementing the written AAPs. So there used to be a time where unless you were called into an audit, I mean, that is actually still the case as of now until this initiative takes, takes force and, and moves forward, um, where unless you were called in for an audit, you know, no one was necessarily checking your AP. I mean, of course, to register on the same da database and, and to sort of go through certain procedures, you had to verify that you were com compliant with you know, OFCCP obligations. And part of that, of course, includes an AP if you were subject to um, those thresholds, right? So, but there was no way of sort of, you know, coming in and, and checking and, and asking for your AP um, unless you were, you were subject to an audit. What this directive and initiative now sort of asks or outlines is that the OFCCP is going to now verify and monitor con contractors compliance with written AP requirements. So this will include the OFCCP developing a process for contractors to annually, annually certify compliance with their written AP obligations. Um, it's going to involve the OFCCP developing some sort of information technology or really I think what they're going to do and they have a landing page for this actually um, that came out early this year, I believe in March. Um, so I think what they're doing, they're gonna now have this interface on the OFCCP website where you essentially as a contractor will go in and verify um, that you're compliant and potentially, and this is sort of what the director, directive is, is calling for, have the OFCCP collect and facilitate review of your AAP. So this will require you to timely submit your written APs um, in an audit. And then of course, also on top of that, verify on this sort of interface that you're actually you know, complying with your AP obligations. So 
Um, it's kind of a big deal. I mean, the hope is that this isn't really a big deal for, for most contractors because they're doing this <laughs> on an annual basis as, as need be. Um, but, you know, obviously this is one more way of sort of ensuring that um, contractors are meeting their obligations. So that's something that we'll continue to monitor. Again, if you go to the OFCCP website or if you just type in Affirmative Action Plan Verification, OFCP, you'll see that there's a landing page developed and it just says, you know, coming soon, stay tuned. Um, so we'll keep an eye out and see, you know, when that actually comes forward. The next thing was um, there were actually no focused reviews on the earlier CSAL list, so the um, scheduling announcement list that came out earlier this year in March. Um, so there's been three, I believe three, right, lists that have come out thus far this year. So on March 2nd, we had um, the OCCP announce a revised fiscal year 2020 supply and service scheduling um, CSAL. So that list came out earlier this year. In July, we had the fiscal year 2021 supply and service scheduling CSAL list come out. And then just, uh, I believe it was September 1st, we had the fiscal year 2021 construction contractor scheduling list come out. Um, but notably, on the uh, 2021 CSAL list that came out, it did not include compliance checks and it did not include promotion and accommodation focused re reviews. So um, it brought the number of evaluations down. Um, but again, I think this was sort of a, a mixture of a backlog from 2020, trying to get up to speed and sort of dealing with everything all at once. So that was interesting. I mean, we, we expect that the focus reviews will come back and they'll come back in full force, but that was something interesting that sort of came out of that earlier list. Um, that amended CSAL list also didn't include um, universities and higher education, um, but that was something that the OCCP said it would come out with eventually. Um, and that was sort of the big list that came out earlier this year. But Moving forward, we'll talk a little bit more about the list that came out um, just recently in the past few months. And a little bit more on focus reviews, I, I just figured it was important to note since these are actually you know, pretty new. We talked about section 503 focus reviews. We talked about what a focus review actually is. Just last year in September 2020, the agency also published separate landing pages for two other types of focus reviews. So promotions focus reviews and then also accommodations focus reviews. So, um, you know, again, these are going to be sort of new enforcement mechanisms, a whole new realm of, of reviews um, and things that the OCCP is going to be looking for. So as, as it relates to any promotions and you know decisions related to that you want to make sure that you know of course those are also being handled in a non-discriminatory fashion again this you know the OCCP's mission is to ensure that there's no discrimination in every aspect of employment you know whether it's promotions uh, termination hirings you know everything compensation right so um, those are, you know, things to sort of look out for. There are a variety of resources already um, added on to these websites and these pages. So I encourage contractors to sort of go in and sort of get an understanding of what these things are going to look like. Um, but we do expect a lot more resources and a lot more guidance to come in. So um, we'll keep an eye out for that. Um, Another important thing to note on here that I have is if a contractor has been scheduled for a focus review, it cannot be scheduled for any other types of compliance evaluations while that review is pending. Um, so I actually had that happen recently with a client where they were undergoing a Section 503 focus review and then a, the new CSAL list came out and they were actually on that list for a compliance evaluation. We emailed the compliance officer and they were removed from that compliance evaluation list. So, um, you know, 
something to note that if you are and if you are undergoing a focused review um, with the OFCT, um, you should not be scheduled for any other types of compliance evaluations while that review is pending. Um, and again, like we talked about, the OFCCP website is a great resource and there should be information, guidance, and, and actually best practices for each specific review type. And, you know, I would encourage all contractors to actually review that list of best practices um, because that's sort of the guidebook that the compliance officers are going to use, right? So if you're sort of going through that list and, and you check off each of those practices, um, then, you know, your probably safe bet is that you will be fine when undergoing an audit because that's sort of what um, checklist the compliance officers are going to be given, right? So um, something else to look out for. And these are actually, you know, I just wanted to touch on these because I think they were, you know, it's pretty important to kind of talk about what executive orders are also happening. I think, you know, in the past year, we had some executive orders issued by the prior president. And then as soon as President Biden came in, in fact, I think on inauguration day, um, you know, he immediately revoked a handful of those executive orders and, and two of them specifically that we have on here and I'll address relate to federal contractors, right? So the first is executive order 13985 um, entitled advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government. So this revokes executive order 13950, um, which was issued by President Trump, which if, if you may recall, um, essentially banned um, any sort of diversity training related to specific, I mean, there is a, a whole set of specific um, items that contractors are banned from, from providing training for. Um, but, and there were sort of, and it happened sort of last minute, and there are questions on how contractors should implement that and, and how to do it. But President Biden sort of ended that and basically said under his new executive order, um, Equity, right, and advancing equity is is critical. Um, it creates opportunities for the improvement of communities that have been historically underserved. And it's actually the obligation of each agency, including the OFCCP, to assess whether and to what extent um, its programs and policies actually, you know, prevent or promote systemic barriers to such opportunities for people of color and other uh, other underserved groups. So. All this to say, um, you know, there should, there may be guidance um, and some policies and protocols coming from the OFCCB with regard to how federal contractors should be implementing, um, you know, certain protocols to advance this specific executive order. And the other is Executive Order 13988, and this is entitled Preventing and Combating Discrimination on the Basis of Gender Identity or Sexual Orientation. And basically with this, President Biden sets forth um, a policy on ensuring equal treatment un under the law, regardless of an individual's gender identity or sexual orientation. And basically this is requiring the head of each agency, so this will require Director Yang of the OFCCP to you know, review all existing orders and regulations um, to ensure that all sex discrimination is prohibited. And then, you know, it gives sort of broad range of authority to agencies to consider any additional actions necessary to ensure compliance um, with the administration's policy on, on combating gender identity and sexual orientation discrimination. So again, these executive orders don't necessarily put any onus on federal contractors themselves. However, we expect that we may see some guidance um, and some policies and protocols coming down from the OCCP in order to enforce these executive orders and ensure compliance with them. And now let's sort of talk about compliance and audit. So what this all means, right? So what is all of this background and all of the, you know, what the future of the OCCP will look like. What does this actually mean for federal contractors? 
So the first is, we'll go through this really quickly. So who's required to prepare an AAP? The federal contractors and subcontractors with at least 50 employees. And I would add with, um, you know, 50,000 or more, right? So remember that under Executive Order 11246, it's the 50-50 rule. Under VEVRA, it's 50 and then $150,000 contract value. But the most important thing is if you have at least 50 or more employees, then check the monetary threshold. And then depending on that, you will either need to, you know, create only an executive order 11246 AP, or you may, to, may need to also develop your section 503 and Debra AAPs as well. So just take note of which ones apply. Uh, something to note with regard to reporting season. So, you know, one thing that you want to make sure as well as, you know, ensuring your OFCCP I'm sorry, your AAP obligations is that there are also part of um, the OSCCP rules and regulations are ensuring that you're uh, filing your yearly reports, right? So this includes your VETS 4212 reports, your EEO reports. Um, so just be sort of proactive about um, how you're filing these reports. Usually, and we'll talk a, a little bit more about this, is sort of having a team that is your go-to sort of EO compliance team, right? So these are the folks who are gonna help with, if you need to develop your AP, help with organizing sort of the data and then the analyses and putting together the AP. These are the folks who are gonna put those calendar reminders to ensure that as soon as the EO and VETS reporting, um, you know, filing, open that you, they're actually the ones to go ahead and process those. So it's, it's pretty important and pretty imperative, I would say, to have a team that's focused solely on ensuring that all of the OCCP obligations are being met, because there is a lot, right? So, I mean, even if you're not developing, developing an AP, you have an obligation to ensure that you're distributing your self-ID forms, that you're doing it in a correct way, that they're compliant, that you're using the required form, um, that, for example, with regard to reasonable accommodations, those are getting processed, documented, the dispositions are being recorded, right? There's a lot. There's a lot that you need to ensure compliance with. And it's imperative that you sort of have a team that is your go-to team that has all of this sort of sorted out. So developing a checklist is great. Um, you know, if you need sort of a rundown of different things that you're entitled to comply with and sort of going through the checklist and making sure that you're um, compliant with each of those things as the time comes, that's highly recommended and, and really important. So um, the EO1 2019 and 2020 component one data should have already been filed, hopefully. <laughs> the due date for that was late August. and uh, I'm sure for many of you who are responsible for doing these things, you knew that it was constantly being pushed back and pushed back and we didn't know what was happening. Um, but because of the pandemic, the 2019 filing deadline was a little bit in limbo. And then 2020 also got sort of, you know, pushed back a little bit, but both 2019 and 2020 were due back on August 23rd. Um, and just some logistical things. I mean, make sure that your username and password are valid and they actually work. If this, if this is your organization's first year of reporting, you want to make sure that you give yourself plenty of time to actually register and get your username because just like, you know, registering for any other website, there's a process of going through and actually submitting sort of an application of sorts and registering your, your, your organization and then obtaining your username. So you don't want to sort of do that the day of and then run the risk of not having an opportunity to actually file your reports um, when they're due. Um, but otherwise, you know, that's one thing to really take note of is ensuring that you're filing the appropriate reports at the appropriate time. The next thing really is to just stay organized. Um, so this is with regard to the reporting season, but this also applies to your APs. So you wanna know which payroll week you're using um, in the prior year for purposes of the EO reports. But for your AP, you wanna make sure that you have 
um, your AP date picked out, you have the snapshot, you have the look back period as far as the data that you're collecting from the prior year. Um, and you wanna just try to stay consistent with all of these every year, right? So with regards to your reporting, you want to stay consistent with the payroll week that you use for reporting. So, for example, if you use the same week in August, um, you know, stay stick to that each reporting year. It just makes things easier and it keeps everything organized and there's not going to be any sort of last minute um, a fluster at, at the end. So that and as well as keeping copies of past reports handy for reference. So, of course, you know, you're probably going to have adjustments and updates made to every year um, and every report, um, depending on, you know, changes in your workforce. But keeping copies of past reports will certainly help if there is, for example, a change in HR person. And, you know, instead of having to kind of go back and, and retrain and, and do all these things, if you have these past reports handy, then they can certainly serve as great reference in order to actually put together your new reports for the new year. Uh, this is sort of, I, I always keep this on here, but this is more just sort of a <clears throat> recommendation, but you want to make sure that your team um, is not only set, but it is set for the critical times, right? So if you know, for example, that your EO1 report were due August 23rd of 2021, then you want to sort of be cognizant of making sure that, you know, there those days right so that august 23rd date and any date surrounding that you have your team intact and in place and there aren't going to be you know people going on vacation during that time and and causing a lot more commotion that needs to be so again it doesn't mean that that anyone from that team cannot take a vacation or, or go on to pto um but just keep that reporting deadline in mind when planning for you or your team to be out during that time. So again, this involves creating an organized checklist and putting in sort of the deadlines and the dates just so you're aware of what you need to do and what people you need in place to ensure that you're moving forward with you know, your compliance um, measures and that you're actually reporting and there's not gonna be any last minute disaster. As far as OFCCP audits, um, so we talked about this a little bit earlier. On July 2nd of this year, the OFCCP published a new CSAL list for fiscal year 2021. Um, that was for supply and service contractors only. Um, I have on here that the CSAL list for construction contractors are to be issued soon. So that actually got issued. <laughs> Um, the slide needed a little updating, but that was actually issued September 1st of this year. So both sets of lists are out. Um, and uh, again, for any CSAL list that comes out, generally the CSAL provides contractors a sort of 45 day courtesy notification um, before the OCCP then actually sends out its OMB approved scheduling letter. So, it's always important, again, part of your team to designate someone to keep an eye out for the CSAL list. Of course, for our clients, we're always looking and we'll you know, immediately let them know if we see them on the CSAL list. But um, you, know, you can certainly do that internally as well as, as making sure that someone from your team um, keeps an eye out for these lists and is actually looking um, to make sure you know, your organization is or is not on there. Because as soon as that CSAL list comes out that actually sort of gets the ball rolling as far as, as, far as what the OCCP does from there. Um, so once the CSAL list comes out, you have 45 days before the actual scheduling letter comes out. And then once the scheduling letter is received, then you have 30 days to then submit um, your AAPs or any supporting documentation that you need to. So having that 45 days sort of as a grace period obviously helps. <laughs> um, it's an added 45 days that you can work on getting everything in order and, and you know making sure that everything's organized and in place as opposed to then receiving your scheduling letter and then actually only being on notice for 30 days. I will say generally that 30 days can be 
extended. I, I have yet to come across any compliance officer say no to me as far as requesting any sort of extension on submission. Um, usually though, you'll get an extension on submission of supporting data or underlying data, but not necessarily uh, an extension on the actual AP because the thought is you should have that ready to go. Um, and you're not just you know creating your AP in the 30 days here. So keep that in mind. Again, once the CSAL list comes, to the time that you have to, you know, submit your AP, that's that's 75 days, right? So 75 days where you can start to, you know, get your team together, put everything together, um, and ensure that all is good to go. Again, keep in mind that as you know, you you have the option of requesting extension. It's not obligatory, so a compliance officer could say no. I haven't seen that happen, but um, again, that's never say never. uh we talked about this and no need to go through that um again these are two helpful links with regard to the first being um what the scheduling letters are and sort of what they involve and what to expect um so there's a good website on there basically a set of faqs regarding what you know scheduling letters encompass what they're required what things you need to submit um, again, I would encourage folks to, you know, either work with counsel or really have like a well-trained team um, as far as what the scope of information is that you should be submitting, right? So sometimes the OCCP could be asking for things that you are not necessarily obligated to turn over because you don't fall under, uh, for example, a Section 503 um, AP obligation, right? So. You want to make sure that you're well aware of what the actual obligations are that you're entitled to and making sure that you are only providing the extent of information that is actually required of you because the last thing you want to do is provide the OCCP with more information and more documentation that they can get their hands on um, and you never know what they would you know that they could be doing and what things they can find with that um, the other website here is a list of contractors on the scheduling list. This was the link to that first um, July 2nd list that came out for supply and contractors. There's obviously going to be um, a new link for the recent CSAL list that came out. But again, these are all available on the OCCP website. The last thing um, is sort of dealing with employee complaints. So obviously, the OFCCP also does handle, um, you know, an employee complaint of discrimination. Um, so if they were, and that's generally a lot of, um, you know, enforcement mechanisms and authority comes from an employee submitting a complaint to the OFCCP and the OFCCP coming um, to your door, right? So um, just some best practices here. You want to just make sure that you're setting up a robust system of intake that is really well outlined in any sort of policy or, or handbook that you're giving to your employees. So this generally means assigning any complaints to come to a central location. So typically this will be an HR representative or you know a few people in HR. Um, allowing for confidential complaints to be made. So you want to ensure and reiterate that all complaints will be kept confidential to the extent possible, right? Because some disclosure may be needed to be made to an enforcement agency like the OFCCP. But you want to make sure that generally speaking, when that initial complaint comes in and an investigation takes place, that all um, measures are being taken to ensure that it's kept confidential. Um, and you just want to be as transparent as possible with employees with regards to the complaint pro process. So you never want to necessarily promise a deadline for an outcome or say that you're going to, um, you know, get back to them by tomorrow. Um, but you just want to acknowledge your seat and, you know, schedule some next steps and then sort of ensure that you have the communication lines open so that they know that their, their complaints being heard and it's being acted upon because that is generally probably the top, you know, reason why employees will then take their complaint elsewhere is what if they feel like internally it's not being handled properly or not being not being taken seriously. So you want to make sure that that's being addressed, you know, appropriately. 
And some last best practices here. I think these are, you know, pretty self-explanatory, but organization is key. Um, these audits are never going to come at a good time. They're always going to come at, you know, a, a horrible time or in the in the midst of, you know, an onboarding or a, a workforce or a contract coming in. I mean, they're never going to be a good time. So you want to just make sure that you're you're organized. You have that team in place. Have all of your documents in sort of a central known place so that multiple people multiple people have access to them. Again, this sort of goes back to the vacation and PTO issue. Again, it's not, it's okay if people are taking vacation or PTO days that are part of that team. Um, but you want to just make sure you're organized and that you have other people who have access to those documents in the event that um, other folks are not accessible. Um, and then the other part of your record keeping requirement under the OFCCP obligations is that you are keeping your AAPs for at least three years. Um, so you want to make sure that any APs that you have, um, you're keeping on, you know, within that time period because the OFCCP can go back and, and seek um, APs up to that time period. And I think that was sort of a question that was asked as how far does the OFCCP go back when auditing? They can go back up to that three year period. So that's something to take note of. Uh, you know, again, always work under the assumption that you're going to get a charge and audit letter. I mean, you are, as a contractor, obligated to meet the obligations under the OCCP rules and regulations. So as I talked about with the AP verification initiatives, you know, you may not necessarily be called upon to, to submit your AP unless this initiative, you know, takes effect and actually moves forward. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, these are obligations that you have to meet and you have to ensure compliance and you want to make sure that regardless of an audit or not, that you're actually staying on top of making sure that these obligations are being met. And as soon as you get one year, um, you know, in, if you're a new federal contractor, that first AAP is always going to be the hardest AAP. That first year, you know, rolling out the self-ID forms is always going to be hard. But once you get going, it's always going to be easier. And it's just a matter of sort of building um, on top of that every year and moving forward. So know the regulations, um, you know, know what the auditor agency representative will request, because knowing those things and being very knowledgeable of what the actual obligations are will ensure that you're meeting and responding in a way that's only necessary, right? And you're not doing more or above and beyond what's needed of you. The last thing here would be just to make sure that you have, um, you know, for some smaller federal contractors, this may not necessarily make sense, but for if you anticipate growing over the next few years, and if you anticipate moving above, especially that 50 employee threshold, um, you know, we generally encourage contractors to have a robust applicant tracking system in place. Um, you know, they could be, can range sort of as, as far as prices go and, and are pretty costly, but generally tend to be an invaluable investment um, because they make sure that everything's sort of in place and sort of ensure that your organization is prepared for an audit. So it keeps everything organized. And when it comes time to pulling data, especially as it relates to pulling your AP together, having that APS system and uh, resource is actually fantastic. So we would highly encourage folks to to consider investing in in an applicant tracking system. And again, you know, just be familiar with your organization and its internal practices. Have a working familiarity with the OCCPs, the laws and regulations they govern, and then of course what they necessarily mean to your particular organization. So again, plan prepare, those are probably the two biggest tips um, as far as, you know, how to deal with the OCC is just make sure that you're planned um, and prepared. We talked about a checklist here. We talked about doing internal audits, especially um, pay audits. Record keeping is a top violation found in OCCP audits, so that's an easy one to fix, right? So just make sure you're keeping your records in a timely fashion. 
and that should do it. Um, so we're hitting the, the mark here on the hour. I think I've addressed, I believe, every question here. If not, I apologize, but my contact information is on here in the event that you have any questions, you know, feel free to personally contact me. I will also get a uh, full list of all questions at the end, and I'll make sure to address them as best I can to each individual. Um, a recording of this webinar will be provided, so the event that you need one, you know, feel free to ask. And otherwise, I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day.